If you have your Bible with you this morning, open with me to Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. I want to look this morning together at Proverbs 22, verses 12 and 13. Proverbs 22, verses 12 and 13. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, but He overthrows the words of the treacherous man. The sluggard says, there is a lion outside. I will be killed in the streets. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this morning. We thank You for Your Word, that You have preserved it from generation to generation and that we have it now that we might be able to learn from it, that we might be able to see more of Your Son. And so, Lord, we ask that even in this Old Testament text, that You would show us more of Your Son, that You would reveal to us more of His beauty and glory and worth. Father, we pray this in His name. Amen. There was a story of a young girl whose mother would tuck her into bed at night. And right before this young girl's mother walked out of the bedroom, she turned off the lights. And the little girl said, Mommy, do I have to turn my lights off? And the mom responded, Well, yes, honey, you have to have your lights off so you can go to bed. And the little girl responded, Well, God keeps the moon on at night when He goes to sleep. And the mom turned around and responded, Well, honey... That's because God never sleeps. And so in this text this morning, what we see ultimately is in verse 12, something about the character or nature or attributes of God. We see something about who God is and what God does. And in verse 13, we see the sluggard who is presented to us, someone who is often tempted to stray away from trusting in God, someone who is often tempted to look at the things of the world and be captured by fear and dismay. What I want us to see in verse 12 is the irrationality of fear. The irrationality of fear. Look with me at Proverbs 22, verse 12. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, but He overthrows the words of the treacherous man. Now, when the Bible speaks of the eyes of God or the hands of God or of the feet of God, it's what's known by theologians as anthropomorphic language. That is, language that explains in human terms that which is not human. So, in other words, God does not have a body because we're told elsewhere in Scripture that God the Father is spirit. And so God the Father does not have a physical body like you and I have physical bodies. Now, Jesus Christ took on a human body, being truly man and truly God. But God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, they uh, being three persons in one God, the Trinitarian Godhead, they do not have a body, a physical body. And so here in verse 12, when it speaks of the eyes of the Lord, this is, again, anthropomorphic language. It is language that helps you and me to understand something about the nature and the character of God. Namely, here in verse 12, that God sees all things. Now, I've told you before in other sermons that this should be both a comfort and a terror that God sees all things. For you who are in Christ, who have placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ under the salvation of your soul, this should be a great comfort and encouragement to know that God sees absolutely everything that you face. And not just in the moment that it's playing out in your life, but that He sees it in advance, having planned it in advance. His seeing is His knowing. His knowing is His doing. And so God sees all things. He is omniscient. That is, He knows all things. There is nothing that takes God by surprise. In Job, in the last chapters of Job, we see this uh, onslaught of questions that God gives to Job. Have you instructed me in anything? Has anyone ever instructed me in anything? No one has ever taught God anything. 
God has never learned anything. God has never had to look down some tunnel of time to figure out what was going to happen in the future, but He has always and forever seen and understood all that takes place because He has divinely planned it. And so in verse 13, or in verse 12, excuse me, we see the eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge. Now again, this tells us something about an attribute of God, the omniscience of God. The, the Puritans would refer to these attributes rather than as attributes as His perfections, as the perfections of God, that God knows all things perfectly, that He sees all things perfectly, that He plans all things perfectly. But not only do we see the omniscience of God in verse 12, we see also the immutability of God. In verse 12, it says the eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge. In other words, God upholds that which is true. The Bible will remain forever because it is true. It is the ultimate and sole authority in our lives as believers. And because it is truth, God preserves it or upholds it from generation to generation. It is not as though it changed from last generation to ours or as though it needs to change and be edited from this generation to the next in order to make it more relevant. But the Word of God is living and active, able to pierce to the division of spirit and soul. We don't need to update the Word of God every few years or so. God preserves the Word because it is knowledge, because it is truth. We're told in John chapter 14, verse 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so... What we're told here is that all truth is preserved or held together in Christ. If we look at the news today, it's often hard to sift through that which is true and that which is not. It's often hard to try to figure out who's telling the truth and who's telling a lie. Who's telling that which is good for the people and that which is good for them. It's hard to discern those things sometimes but not so with the Word of God. We don't have to come to the Old Testament and the New Testament of the Christian Scriptures and say, well, let me sift through this. Let me see what's true and what's false. Let me see what's just uh, figurative language. Let me see what's, what's actually meaningful to us. Let's see what's just old news that we need to unhitch ourselves from and what we actually need to hold together today. Let's just sift through all of this. We know that the whole Word of God is the whole truth. And God preserves it. And in His preservation of it, we again see His immutability that God never changes and therefore His truth never changes. Not only that, we see the omnipotence of God or the power of God and that the eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge. That God is powerful enough to hold His Word from generation to generation that no matter what comes against God and His kingdom and His word, His word remains true. Nothing ever puts God at risk of losing His supreme authority. No one has ever elected God to office, and no one has to re-elect God to office. God is God. He is God. He always has been God, He is God today, and He will forever be God. And no other little g gods or idols that we have in our lives or in our society or in our culture around us will ever make God susceptible to being cast off of His throne. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. All-powerful enough to preserve His truth, to hold His truth up, no matter what comes against it. The other attribute of God that we see, or again, as the Puritans would call them, the perfection of God, is in the second clause of verse 12. But he overthrows the words of the treacherous man. We see his justice or his equity. That God is not a pacifist. That God does not allow for sin and sinners to stand in his courtyard. But that instead he will cast them out. He will cast out Sinfulness. He will cast out that which is false. He will not allow it to stand. It will be burned up in the last days. Now, King Solomon is writing 
first and foremost to the primary audience of His own Son. But He's writing to us too because God's Word again has been preserved according to verse 12. So what is all of this about? Why is Proverbs 22 verses 12 and 13 included in our Bibles? Well, go back with me to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. And we'll see exactly what all of this is about. Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, so there we have that King Solomon is the author or human writer of these under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. To understand a proverb and a figure, the word of the wise and their riddles, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. In other words, King Solomon is writing so that he might pass down some wisdom to his son. He wants to teach his son and us by and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in this book how to fear the Lord. And so in other words, what he's doing here in Proverbs 22 verses 12 and 13 is he's teaching us how to appropriately place our fear. You see, so often we have fear that is misplaced. And we see that in verse 13. Proverbs 22 verse 13. The sluggard says, that is, the lazy man. We'll come back to that. The sluggard says, there is a lion outside. I will be killed in the streets. Now the language that he uses here, I will be killed in the streets, is not figurative, is not illustrative. It is literal language. He actually believes that if he goes out into the public square, or into the streets, as that's translated, into the public square, if he goes outside of the front doors of his house and his home church, He's going to not just be killed by being cast out, by being an outcast of society and being killed in his social life. He's not just going to be killed by having his feelings hurt. He literally believes that he will be murdered, that he will be assassinated, that he will be torn to bits and pieces. And that's why in verse 13, at the beginning of that, the sluggard says, there is a lion outside. There is one prowling around who seeks to destroy me, who seeks to absolutely obliterate me, to tear me into pieces. Now the irony of this is that the sluggard isn't wrong. He's not lying. He's not telling some falsehood. The sluggard is telling something that is entirely true. We know it to be true. 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So, what do we do? Since verse 13 is true, that there is a lion prowling around seeking whom he may devour, since verse 13 is not a falsehood, this slugger just giving this excuse just to abdicate himself from actually doing anything, since it is true and since the fear that or that which we fear is real then why not fear it why not just throw in the towel and say well i there's a lion out there the devil is powerful enough to destroy me the devil could tear me into pieces the devil could rise raise up people against me and everybody could hate me i could be an outcast of society i could literally be torn to pieces i could be put in prison for preaching the gospel i could be murdered for it i could be hated for it i could be made fun of for it since all of that is true i'm just going to not do anything you see the world is perfectly fine with us as christians living our christian life in private they're perfectly fine with that so long as we come here and have our worship service for an hour each Sunday, but then we shut the doors of the church, lock them up, and lock all that we hold true behind those doors. So long as we have our beliefs and convictions within our own households, but when we leave the household, we leave it there. 
The world's perfectly fine with that. You can have your worship in private. Just don't bring it out in the public. Don't bring all that into your politics. Don't bring all that into your workplace. Don't bring all that into the public squares or as it says in verse 13, into the streets. Leave that in your church. Leave that in your home. Don't bring that into the streets. Because we'll kill you if you do. We'll hate you for it if you do. The world is perfectly fine with us having a secret and private religion. But they're not so okay with us having a public devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. And saying with boldness, Christ is King. That He is Lord. That Caesar is not King. That the King is not King. That Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And so whoever is on the throne, whether in, in local politics or in uh, global politics, whoever is on the throne, that they have been placed there by God and can be removed by God just as quickly. The world doesn't want to hear that. And so that's why in verse 13, the sluggard says, there's a line outside. I will be killed in the streets. If I go out and bring my religion, if I go out and bring verse 12, the truths of who God is and of what God does. If I go out into the world and bring those things with me, they're going to hate me for it. And so what's the result of his fear? Look at how he's defined in verse 13. The sluggard. The lazy man. The one who does nothing. The one who sits around twiddling his thumbs waiting for someone else to do the work. That's the result of this kind of fear. And so my encouragement to us this morning is that we don't allow this sort of godless fear, this sort of misplaced fear of man rather than fear of God to make us sluggish, to make us sleepy Christians who do nothing for the kingdom of God. Instead, we need to do as Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says, and fear God rather than man. We must obey God rather than man. We must fear God rather than man. We must honor God rather than man. It was Spurgeon who said that the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which the child of God rests his head at night, giving him perfect peace. The psalmist in Psalm 27 verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? John Flavel is one of my favorite of the Puritan writers, and he wrote in his book, Triumphing Over Sinful Fear, If we loved our lives less, we would fear and tremble less. We are to esteem our lives as poor, lowly things in comparison to our love for Christ. We are to esteem our lives as poor, lowly things in comparison to our love for Christ. And so here's my question this morning. How can we love and cherish and treasure and honor and obey and fear the Lord Jesus Christ so much, so deeply, that the things of this world grow strangely dim in comparison to the light of His glory and grace? Let me put it another way. How can our fear of Christ Make whatever fear of man we might have to just go away. And to say, yes, there is a reality that the world hates what I have to tell them. Yes, there is a reality that I might be an outcast socially speaking. Yes, there is a reality that I might lose my job. Yes, there is a reality that I might be hated by, by my neighbors. Yes, there is even a reality that I might be literally, verse 13 of Proverbs 22, put to death. But all of that would be worth it. If only I could tell someone of the name of Christ. Go with me to Matthew 28 really quickly. Matthew 28. I want to look together at the Great Commission and I want to see three things here. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, 
and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now there are three things I want to see. The first is in verse 17. When they, being the disciples, saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some were doubtful. Now these were the disciples. These were the twelve who had walked with Jesus, who had witnessed all of the miracles He had performed. They heard His authority and His teaching. They heard all of the preaching that He had. They heard the unraveling of the prophecies that pointed to Him. They saw and witnessed it all. They had walked with Him for these three years of His earthly ministry. And yet, some were still doubtful. Some were still unsure. Some were still tempted to dismay. Now, I don't know about you, but that's an encouragement. To know that these who had literally walked with Jesus, yet still faced doubts and times of dismay. That's an encouragement for me because sometimes I I don't doubt God. I don't doubt His existence. I don't doubt the reality of who He is. But sometimes I'm tempted to, to doubt whether or not He's at work in my particular situation. Sometimes I'm tempted to doubt whether or not He cares if I bring this small concern to Him whenever someone else is dealing with the loss of a loved one and that concern is far deeper than my concern. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're tempted at times to have these sorts of doubts. But verse 17 is an encouragement to me. To know that even the disciples who walked closest with him in his earthly ministry had doubts at times. And here's the encouragement that Jesus comes alongside those who were doubtful and he gives to them. Verse 18. And Jesus came up to them and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. The second thing I want us to see in this text is that Jesus has all authority. That he doesn't have some authority, he doesn't have most authority, he doesn't have authority over that which we have given him authority over. He has all authority. And not just in the abstract, in the spiritual world, in this sort of religious uh, concept, just kind of hanging out in the air. But he says, in heaven and on earth. So Christ is Lord of everything. No one makes him Lord. No one makes him the supreme one. He is the supreme one. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, given to him by whom? By the Father. By the Father, not by you and me, by the Father. The Father has endowed him with this authority to rule over all things in heaven and on earth. And verse 19, the third thing I want us to see. Go therefore. Go therefore. And make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Go therefore. So if we just tell one another to go, we're only telling each other half of the story. We're only telling each other a part of the story. In the late 1970s, Paul Harvey had a news radio program entitled The Rest of the Story. Well-known stories were rehearsed, but then bits and pieces of the stories that were lesser known were given as the rest of the story. If we tell people to go and make disciples, we're only giving them part of the story. We need to give them the rest of the story, and the rest of the story is hinged upon that one word, therefore. Go, therefore. Go based upon the fact that Christ is king, based upon the fact that he has not sent you out into a pointless battle. He has not sent you out into a war that you will lose. He has sent us out into a war that we will win because Christ has already won it. Having said upon the cross at Calvary, it is finished. And all authority is His. And at the end of verse 20, we have this great encouragement, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now that phrase, I am, is translated from the Greek phrase, ego, I me, which is literally, I am that I am. It is to say, God with you always. God is with us. What an encouragement that is to know that God is with us. And so taking that back into Proverbs 22 for just a moment. Verse 12, 
The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, but he overthrows the words of the treacherous man. Knowing that God is with us, that Christ is on the throne, that everything in this world belongs to him, and that the earth is his footstool. Knowing who God is and what God does, that he is in control, that he is sovereign over all, that he is the supreme one, enables us never to be defined by verse 13. Trusting in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ helps us never to be like the sluggard who says, there is a lion outside, I will be killed in the streets. But instead to say, there's a lion outside, I will be killed in the streets, and so what? I'm going to live for Christ anyway. Jonathan Edwards said, resolved, I will live for Christ. Resolved, I will live for Christ, even if no one else does. So that's my prayer for us, is that we would not be like this sluggard, but instead we would be like those who have been saved by the miraculous grace of Christ and who want to tell anyone and everyone who has ears to hear of what Christ can do for them. Let me close with a story. There was a man from Africa. His name was Joseph. And he was saved under the crusade ministry of Billy Graham. And he went back to his small African hut village and would go door to door canvassing from hut to hut telling his neighbors about Christ and about salvation and about their need to repent of their sins and their idols. And if you know anything about Africa, you know that it is a country of great idolatry. And so they hated him for it. And so the men dragged him out into the public square, into the, the square of their town, and they beat him nearly to death and left him to die outside of their village. By a miracle of God, the man came back and would go back door to door telling them again of the gospel. And this time, not only the men would beat him, but the women and the children would actually surround him and try to beat this man to death for telling them the gospel. And again, they would leave him to die. But as the man woke up that second time, he noticed that he was surrounded by the people who had beat him nearly to death. And instead of beating him to death, they were now nursing him back to health. And the reason for that was because as he closed his eyes from the second beating that he took for sharing the gospel, he closed his eyes saying, Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And he woke up to find that all those who were around him had come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and they had been saved. That is the power of the gospel. That is the power of the gospel. That even those who absolutely hate anyone who would have anything to say about Christ can come to salvation by the power of Christ at work in them. So that encourages me that I don't have strength enough. I don't have wisdom enough. I don't have intelligence enough to share the gospel. But it's Christ at work in me. And it's Christ at work in each and every one of us who sit in this room this morning claiming His blood as our redemption. What a precious gift it is to know that God is on the throne, that He is with us always. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your Son and for what He has accomplished on our behalf. And Lord, we thank You that He is with us now, that He has not left us, that He has not merely given us the tools to then go on about our own, but that He is with us, that He is actively and forever working in and through us. So Father, would You help us? Help us to love Him and treasure Him and cherish Him so much that Romans 8.18, which tells us that the worries of this world pale in comparison to the beauty that we will behold on the other side of glory when we behold Christ. Help that to be a reality for us now. That as we behold His beauty, His glory, that all the things of earth would grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Would You empower us to be people on the move for Your kingdom. And we pray this in Christ's strong name.